Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee again here with another episode of the Plant Free MD. And today I have a very special return guest, uh, Mr. Ryan Talbot, who is an NCAA uh, Division I track athlete from Michigan State and was um, just finished up with the Big Ten Championships and is here to tell us about how all that went. And Ryan, thank you so much for coming down. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, not a problem, man. How have you been doing? Good, like really good. Seriously, yeah, it's awesome. and body has been feeling great recently. Right. And so you've been, I I think we spoke to you maybe even nearly, was it a year ago, maybe like eight months ago, something. Well, it was quite some time ago anyway. And I think it was just after your last big 10 championship last year. So it might've been actually about a year. Um, And so you've been carnivore now, I think close to 18 months now, um, over a year now. And so, yeah. so how have you feeling with that? How have you noticed that that's affected your training and your, and your performance? Yeah, I, like, I feel great. And obviously I think there was definitely a period where I was getting used to the carnivore diet and like within those first like six months, like my body was going through a lot of changes. Mm-hmm. Um, now I feel like I'm starting to even out on those like changes and just like, I'm at a really good level of functioning where I like kind of can understand what my body needs for competition and recovery and what I can do to improve that stuff. And I can also listen to my body more when I'm like, man, I slept really bad last night. Like, why did I sleep bad? Oh, okay. It's probably because I tried to eat a piece of cheese and like, I just slept weird and I'm just going to cut that out, you know? And so yeah, it's I've I've really found that just staying strict to carnivore and just meat and salt and water and just it, like it's the perfect combination for me. Awesome. And so obviously you're not you're not taking any cars, but you're you're a decathlete. And so this is one of the more rigorous uh sporting events uh that that there is, and you're one of the top athletes. Um and so how how is that training without carbohydrates? How have you felt? Um or, or did you feel a difference or you just feel as good or better or, or what, what did you notice? Yeah. You no, fall I, flat I on definitely. your face and just die without carbs. Yeah, I, I definitely feel better. And it's, I think one of the biggest things is like not having to constantly refuel throughout the day, mm. either at practice or competition, you know, like before carnivore at practice, it would be like, all right, I got to get my protein bar in before I work out. And then, after my workout, I got to get some like applesauce in or another protein bar and then go lift. And then after lift, I got to drink this like fake protein shake in a bottle and all this stuff. And now it's just like, I'll wake up and like, all right, am I practicing in the morning? I guess I just won't eat until after practice or practicing in the afternoon. I'll eat a little something before then practice, come home, eat a big meal. And I just find that I have like, I'm not eating as much in quantity now and I'm getting like way better results. And and then also now that my body's metabolism is like working a lot better with burning fats, my energy just lasts for days. Nice. Yeah. And have you noticed that your, your, your performance and like your speed and your, you know, in the different sorts of events are the, are your times getting better on these sorts of uh, things as well? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I know that like right now my body is just getting so strong. It, it feels like so much easier for me to build strength than it ever has before. Um, Like I'm a tall guy and I've always been pretty skinny as a kid and like I, I bulked up a little bit, but it was kind of like a fake bulk. It was kind of like that carbohydrate filling your muscles bulk mm-hmm. that you get. And then after I switched to carnivore, I leaned out and started adding like lean muscle mass. And so like I got stronger and I lost weight. And so my strength to weight ratio was just like through the roof. Now I'm sprinting better and I'm jumping higher because of it. And it's it's so helpful. Nice. 
Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. But for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. So uh, how'd you do at the at the Big Ten uh, championship this year? Yeah, this year I, I came in second place, which was like a huge awesome. achievement. I'm super yeah. happy to come back two years in a row, placing in the top three. Yeah, that's awesome. And you won it last year, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That's so badass, man. And like, <laughs> and that was, that was the thing too. Um, you, I think you started Carnivore. Was that pretty much mid season? Uh, was it, or, or when did you start yeah, it? It was, it was going from indoor season to outdoor season okay. last year. So how did you, how did you notice that transition? Did you notice a lag in your performance, uh, periodically and that came back or did you notice, um, you know, that you just started getting better right away? Yeah, I like people talk about the keto flu and mm. stuff like that. And I felt I, I definitely felt that for the two weeks of where your body aches in weird spots and you're just mm. getting rid of all those like excess carb stores that you have. And um I get like I feel like I felt bad, but it didn't affect my performance at all. Okay. And I, I was able to still perform very well. And then as soon as I got through like the keto flu everything was just like through the roof and like i was just running faster and i was getting a lot less lactic when we would run our workouts mm -hmm. and i i would say that's just because my body was able to recycle the lactate a lot faster mm -hmm. and also it was just dealing with a lot less toxins and crap in the first place so i just didn't have as much to process yeah. um so yeah my endurance went through the roof i was sprinting much better I got way stronger in the gym and like, yeah, my energy would just last for so long. Nice. And, um, so you, you didn't notice that your energy tank, some people would notice that maybe their, um, you know, the energy, they wouldn't have quite the same amount of energy when they're sort of keto adapting. Yeah. Yeah. I like maybe, but I didn't, I didn't really stop working out because I would feel tired. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably because like before going carnivore, I would get that feeling of like, man, I'm just, I'm tired. I'm run down, you know, your insulin jacks up and you go very like parasympathetic and you're super tired and lethargic. And like, that's kind of like how it would end up feeling a lot of times at practice. Cause I would just boost my blood sugar up before I'd go practice. And then I wouldn't feel as good, you know? And so now that my, like, I'm not, jacking up my blood sugar and I'm practicing and like, I just feel great. And so like, it wasn't a big change for me. Yeah. Awesome. And so, so what are you eating uh, now at the moment? Yeah. So, um, now I eat about, I'll say six eggs in the morning with bacon or some ground beef. Mm. And then I'll have a lunch and that'll usually be like a pound of ground beef with a little bit of collagen because I just love the benefits of getting collagen in there. Um, and then steak and eggs, six eggs again for dinner. And that's pretty much it. And also like, like I said, like I don't, I don't need to eat all the time. And so sometimes like if I wake up in the morning, skip breakfast, I'm fine. Skip lunch. I'm fine. You know, it's like, I usually I'm always eating a steak and eggs at the end of the day though. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, um, so have and anyone, anyone on your team or your, your teammates and anyone around you, have they started taking up, uh, some of your advice on, on the diet sort of thing? Um, I think a few people have been maybe eating a little bit more meat, but yeah. it's, it's hard to try and change an athlete's <laughs> perspective, you know? Yeah. especially when they're they think that they're doing good they think that they feel good they think they're healthy you know and they're not going to want to completely throw everything out the window and i also think a lot of people are have a sweet tooth you know and they telling them oh you can't drink gatorade anymore it's like 
well, I don't, I don't want to not do that. You know, yeah. I don't want to live in that world. Yeah. Yeah. And people look at me and they're like, Oh, like you got to loosen up, man. Like it just is like, it seems like a disordered eating, you know, you're not doing any of this. And I'm like, dude, like, I just, I feel so amazing right now that like, I have no desire to change anything about this. Yeah. Yeah. His cows have disordered eating too. They're so, they're so particular about what they eat. <laughs> it's like they, they need to branch out and eat some Skittles or something like that. That, that that's what's healthy. You know, it's, it's, I mean, that's funny how, how people think about these things and they don't actually even realize what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you were saying too, that you had um, a bit of an issue at one point because you were, you didn't get your, you're like, you're, you were eating a lot more protein and, and weren't eating as much fat. Um, yeah. How, what what did you notice that that did to you and uh, and how did you fix that? Yeah, so I think I got to a point where I was eating just a lot of ground beef and the ground beef that I had, we usually will like rotate and get um, like a cow here and there. And it was a grass fed cow, so it was pretty lean ground beef. And for some reason, the the butcher like didn't put as much fat in as we wanted. And so it was probably like a 90, 10 ground beef. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was just eating a lot of that ground beef. And I got to a point where I started to kind of feel like not as much energy. I was feeling a little lethargic, almost similar to like, just like a high insulin response, you know, and maybe a little bit, I don't know. I just, I didn't feel like I had as much energy. I was definitely getting very lean as well. Um, and it was just getting hard to kind of like practice. Yeah. Um, luckily I was always learning and researching about the diet, you know, and I found a video talking about like, it's all about the fat, you know, carnivore diet is great, but it's, it's all about the fat. The fat is what gives you energy. You know, you see all animals are going to go for the fattiest cuts first. They're not going to go for the lean cuts. That's where all the, like the energy is. And so I just increased my fat. I started using a lot more butter in my eggs and I'll go through almost like a stick of butter a day just by cooking eggs in it. Um, getting like the fattiest cuts of ribeyes and just increasing the fat in my ground beef, just all that stuff. And also adding bacon is huge. Um, <laughs> all, all that just increased my fat intake and I started feeling amazing again and it just got, it just got so much easier. Nice. So, you know, since then your, your energy levels went back up, you're able to train harder and it was really yeah. just increasing the amount of fat. Yeah. 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 And like you can, you can get away with eating like high protein, low fat only for a little bit, you know, like your body's going to create what it needs from the protein through like gluconeogenesis, but it's a, it's a hard process and it's not going to want to do that forever. Yeah. You know, so I was, I was able yeah. to survive, but it wasn't like I was thriving again. Mm. Yeah. And you weren't, and you weren't and obviously, you know, as a high performance athlete, like you need to be at your best, you're pushing yeah. yourself to extraordinary degrees. And, and you notice when there's just, you know, a little chink in the yeah. armor. Yeah. I think the carnivore diet has definitely helped me become like very in tune with my body where I can mm. feel those changes very quickly. Yeah. You know, and as I, as I try to remind people fat is not just a calorie source, it's a, it's an essential nutrient. You have to have it and you have to have enough of it and, uh, you need enough fat, you need enough protein, you need enough lean, you need enough fatty. Um, mm -hmm. you, you do need both. And so, you know, I mean, you can, you can do away with one or the other for a certain amount of time, but yeah, you're right. You know, especially if you're, if you're at the, at the upper echelons of, of, uh, of pushing yourself mentally and physically, you know, you do need to, you do need to optimize this and just get it as perfect as possible. And so finding that right, that right yeah. amount uh, of, for you is, is really important. Yeah. And I don't know any carnivores who struggle to get enough protein in the day, you know? Yeah. And that's like, that's why I bring it up is because I think a lot of people hear carnivore diet and just eat meat. And like, it's like, well, carnivore diet is like meat and fat, you know, the fat is key, like you said, Fatty. and there's so many fat soluble nutrients that are just so vital for us humans, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And, and some people ask me, it was like, well, you know, you take protein supplements, you always sort of think, like you really don't need to, 
You know, if you look at, you know, just the amount of, of meat that you're talking about there and the amount of the eggs, I mean, you're talking, you know, at least a couple hundred grams oh, of yeah. protein, if not more, you know, there's totally bioavailable. And mm. so, you know, you're getting, you're getting more than enough and probably, you know, probably, you know, you know, 300 or plus grams of protein. And yeah. so, yeah, so it's not, um, it's really not, not a problem getting enough protein. Yeah. And I think too, like, I, I know because it's the at the type of athlete that I am, I'm going to try to do everything that I can give my body everything that it needs to be successful. And so like, I, I remember earlier in the year I was like supplementing and like, I was taking a little bit of vitamin C just because I know like, Oh yeah, vitamin C is good for recovery. That's what you hear, you know? And then like, a few weeks later, I got this like huge headache and I was just so, so thirsty. I was like, what's going on? And I was like, also like, man, I have this weird tangy taste in my mouth. Like, like, what is this? And, and then I started doing some research and I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm just like offing so much vitamin C from my body right now. Like it's like seeping out of my like saliva glands. And I was like, you just like, I got rid of it. I stopped taking it and like started feeling way better. And like, mm -hmm. it's just, you don't need to supplement as on the carnivore diet. No, definitely not. And, and that's one of the things too, is that excess vitamin C can actually get converted into oxalates and oxalic acid. And you yeah. can actually, you know, cause harm to yourself by doing yeah. that. And, uh, you know, and the, the anti-inflammatory and, or, um, antioxidant effects, I should say of vitamin C have actually largely been taken over by urea, which is a, a breakdown product of, uh, protein amino acids. And so when you're eating a high protein diet, a high carb, you know, and, and a lot of people, uh, sort of get stickler when I, when I say that, you know, and it's, they, they say carnivore is a high fat diet, moderate protein, but I mean, high fat as in higher or sorry, high protein as in higher protein than anyone else is eating because it, it is, yeah. it is higher. It, it relatively is a high protein diet, but it's not pr proportionately in, in the, in your calories, a high protein yeah. diet, but it's more protein than most people are, are eating. And so if you're eating, you know, two, three times the amount of protein, than than other people are eating, your urea is going to be higher than theirs as well. And that's not a sign that your kidneys aren't working because your creatinine can be low. And that's, that's a sign of your, of your kidneys not flushing these things out properly, but your urea is up, your creatinine is low. Well, that means your body's just has it high for whatever reason. Yeah. And that actually works as a really good uh, antioxidant. And it's a, it's a better mechanism of, do, of, uh, of uh, filling that role than vitamin C, which is why we don't need as much vitamin C. Yeah, exactly. And it's nice to with the carnivore diet is like now I really trust my body to do what it needs to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if I have like this high blood marker, my body's doing that for a reason. And I don't need to worry about having like my liver failing or something because I know that I'm giving it all the nutrients that it needs and I'm doing all the healthy things nutritionally that is going to be best for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, that everyone loves to go on about, they're like, okay, well, it looks like you're doing well now, but obviously, you know, your blood are going to be horrible and you're going to die. So yeah. <laughs> I believe you just had some blood work done and you compared yeah. it to your bloods from last year. Do you mind telling us about that? Yeah. So, um, I guess it was right. Like the summer before I started the carnivore diet, I was feeling awful and that's kind of like part of the part that led me into the carnivore diet but um i got my blood work done to make sure like I, everything was all right and they looked at all my blood markers then and they were like yeah like you look healthy everything's fine um and one interesting thing too is like my testosterone back then was at like 740 which is like a pretty decent number for what they consider to be the general norm and um so yeah they were like you're fine like we don't know what's wrong with you and i was like well something's wrong with me but oh well <laughs> finally carnivore diet figured out oh yeah your stomach was just messed up and you felt like crap so a whole year of carnivore and i'm like all right time to retest and see how my blood markers are because we can really get a good look at my health through my blood markers and like everything 
looked amazing. I know the doctor was like really trying to find something. He was like, maybe, maybe this is going to be bad. Maybe this is going to be bad. You know, like we expect to see some things here, you know, and everything, everything was stellar, you know, and one of my favorite markers that improved was my testosterone marker. And it went from 740 in the previous to now it's like 1,160. <laughs> and so it increased by like 400 and like somebody who I, I already thought like, Oh yeah, my testosterone is good. And like, as an athlete, having high testosterone is super important. Mm. Yeah. And so that, that was just awesome to see that it actually improved. Um, and now the funny story is my, the doctor saw that and he's like, Oh, okay. Well, like this is good, but like, we're worried that you could fail a drug test or whatever. And so I got randomly selected to do yeah. a drug test the next week. <laughs> and um, I, he like, he called me later and he was like, yeah, you passed hundred percent. Like there was like, you weren't even close to like failing mm -hmm. the mark because they were just measuring ratios. And he's like, you're hundred percent good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, like that just, I mean, are you naturally increasing your testosterone by like 400? Like you just don't really hear about that. Yeah. It's also, it's also nice too. It's like, Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, you pass. You're really good. Oh, oh, really? I'm not, I'm not taking steroids. Yeah. I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, I told you yeah. that Dick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, what, what other sorts of, uh, tests did they do? Do they test, um, like vitamins, minerals, other hormones, things like that? Yeah. Yeah. They, um, like, a CMP, a CBC. Um, I got my C-reactive protein measured as well, which mm -hmm. was another one of my favorite markers that they measured because the like the low range is like 0.1. Mm -hmm. And most people are sitting in between like 0.1 to 0.3. And I was at 0 0.02. Nice. So it was almost non-existent. <laughs> yeah. But and it was so low. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's, you know, so much for people who say that red meat causes inflammation. It clearly, yeah. clearly does not. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, but like literally all my blood markers were good and a lot of athletes struggle with getting enough like ferritin and mm -hmm. having like high iron in their blood. Mine was great. And it, and like, that's another thing people say is, Oh, your iron's going to be like too high. Cause you're eating too much red meat. It wasn't, it was, in perfect range and mm -hmm. my body was doing what it needs to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it is great. You were talking about, you know, how testosterone is, is so important for athletes. Um, and just, just for health in general, you know, we have obviously as we age, our testosterone levels go down. And I think like testosterone levels in men are down by like 50, 55% since the 1970s. So, you know, that's what people are saying is this like, you're, you're not half the man that your grandfather was. And, uh, and that's what they're talking about that. Like, you know, our grandparents had a much more robust and healthy hormonal profile, both men and women. And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not really seeing that now. And fertility rates are down by 55% as well, which I don't yeah. think is, is, uh, is a coincidence. I think those are tightly related. Um, and, uh, so we see this as well as we go older, <clears throat> excuse me as we grow older obviously our hormonal health changes and it starts starts dampening down and so you know men don't feel as good and they go on you know uh, testosterone replacement therapy and things yeah. like that but you know i have a number of patients quite a lot of them um you know who are interested in that sort of thing and i would say like why don't you try this first and see how you go because you may not even need it um by the time you you get a few months in and just see how you feel and I think without fail, they've all increased their testosterone by, I mean, these are people in their sixties and seventies, some of these guys mm -hmm. increased their testosterone by 30, 40% in, in, uh, in three months on a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. Some of these more, some of these guys have like doubled their testosterone. Mm -hmm. And one guy was like in his late sixties, he was like early seventies. He, he was good. He was very good. Young seventies, very healthy guy. I was, um, you know, concerned about his, his, uh, his health and didn't really drink or smoke or anything like that, but he was like 70 and he increased his testosterone up 
just massively like over doubled it. And he was just like teeming with like, this is amazing. And so that guy like did not need any sort of testosterone replacement. And he's just like, I just want to go to the gym, just work out. You know, I feel like a teenager again. And like his testosterone was that of, of a teenager. Um, well, it's certainly a teenager now. And um, yeah. And so like, it just, it just makes a huge difference. And this is, this is one of the biggest advantages in athletics that no one is using. You know, that like you can you can naturally and legally and safely physiologically increase your testosterone by 400 points, you know, yeah. and uh, and why aren't you doing it? Like this is something you, and, and it helps your body in so many other ways as well. There's so many other advantages, but just that one. I mean, people risk their careers and their health by, you know, injecting steroids or taking these supplements, sometimes dangerous supplements, you know, because who knows where they're coming from, um, if they're getting it sort of on the black market. And they're, you know, and and just just to sort of get their testosterone up artificially, all you have to do is eat meat and not eat all the other crap. And then you get your your testosterone up by huge amounts. I just I don't know why more people are yeah. not jumping all over this. And I just think it's terrible that we're starting to like normalize older men doing TRT and right. getting on testosterone in their well, as they age because they think, oh, oh, as you age, your testosterone decreases. But yeah, maybe like 100 points, not 500, like 800 points. It's not going to it's not going to drop that much. You know, something's wrong if it's dropping that much. Yeah. And, you know, and now they're talking about, you know, with like kids, like younger kids and young adults with like their testosterone is so low. They're talking about, oh, we need to give them testosterone replacement. Or what? yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just like, why wouldn't you be thinking about what the hell is going on? You know, that that's causing yeah. that, right? But yeah. the problem is, is when you have a product at the end of the line, that's that's usually what you see. You see, you see the light at the end of the tunnel is is uh this product that you're selling, as opposed to you know, what's the train passing through this tunnel. Okay. Okay. This is, this is your metabolic health and this is something that's, that's causing harm. And so you're just distracted on the end goal and you're just, and you're not focusing on anything else. And this is, you know, statins and other drugs and things like that. I mean, this is just as what drives the research and the, and the recommendations is just, you have a product. Um, also, you know, I guess, you know, not a lot of doctors understand that you just, even just put people on a ketogenic diet, uh, they're going to improve their hormonal health, both men and oh, women. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and certainly eating a lot more meat and fatty meat, you're definitely going to improve your hormonal health quite significantly. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe people just don't know that. And they're like, oh, well, I don't know, but this kid's not producing a lot of testosterone. So I guess we should give him some testosterone. And I think that's, that's a really bad way of doing things. I think that you you really have to, you have to investigate like why the hell is this happening? And yeah. you know, what are we doing that is causing this to be a, a growing trend in just lower and lower and lower testosterone levels in, in young men? Mm -hmm. And I think like eating the meat and the fat is just so good for building all your hormones, mm -hmm. but also when you avoid all of the toxins you avoid the seed oils, you avoid all the mm. estrogen inducing chemicals and stuff. And, and you're avoiding the plants, like all of that is going to help your body not get rid of all your testosterone and destroy you and like create all this extra estrogen that's going to lower your testosterone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're, we're just eating things. I mean, the plants are trying to disrupt your body in a, no, a number of ways. And part of that is with uh, disrupting your hormones and making so you can't breed. And if you can't breed, then you're not going to, you're not going to raise little kids that go and eat that plant. You know, you're going to teach them eat this fucking plant, you know, it's good. Sorry for swearing. <laughs> like, and, and, um, uh, you know, but, but that's the thing, you know, if they, if they stop you from reproducing, then that is a, you know, a, a, a sort of a lateral move where they, they stop you from, uh, stop more animals from eating them. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're just not getting as much nutrients out of them, if you're not getting as much nutrition out of them as another animal would from another food source, then you're not going to be as competitive in, in the game of survival as another animal is. And so you might die out. Your line may not be as successful. And that other line that's eating other things is going to be more successful. And so that's in the, in the plant's advantage to, to sort of steer steer things off and steer, uh, you know, the, the evolutionary path down a different angle, just say, stay away from me, just go over there. And the ones that yeah. 
do go over there are the ones that survive more. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's benefiting the plant. It does not benefit us. Yeah. Yeah. And also like huge studies are out there showing like as testosterone decreases, like mental health problems increase mm-hmm. and like people are suffering with depression and anxiety at like they it's huge nowadays. And you got to think that's definitely a problem, you know, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just it's just it's just showing up everywhere. And especially like for athletes, like the mental side of sport is super important for performance. And like if you can't mentally have that confidence in yourself to perform, like it's just going to be so much harder. Yeah. And then even lower cholesterol, lower LDL cholesterol is strongly associated with depression and anxiety, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, and that was actually another thing. There was a study that came out. I think it was last year, maybe last year, the year before, and uh, and actually showed that that dietary cholesterol was um, an independent factor in in muscle growth. So you know, the more dietary cholesterol people were getting in, um, the, the easier it was for them to to put on muscle as well. And you know, that could be hormonally. It could be because you're getting things along with something, you know, other things that are going to help that out. But um, but either way, you know, they they found that higher dietary intake. Of, of cholesterol actually associated with, with better muscle growth and, uh, and athletes. Yeah. Yeah. As you found that, I, I remember talking to you and you were, um, uh, you were saying that it was actually, you were, it was, you were finding it was too easy to build muscle. And that was actually like counterproductive. It was like, you were having a hard time not putting on so much muscle because you yeah, didn't yeah. want to be as big as that. Yeah. Earlier, it was earlier. A funny pro- it was a, it was a, I think it's <laughs> probably a good problem to have. Yeah. the opposite but like i don't as a track athlete i love to be strong and fast but if you're too heavy like you're going to slow down a little bit you're not going to jump as high and all that running and pounding on your body you know imagine putting on a five pound weighted vest a 10 pound weighted vest and mm-hmm. going and jogging a mile it's not going to feel as good you know and so i like had easily bulked up to like 215 during the year and I was like man I need to like lean out a little bit for competition because like imagine taking off 10 pounds and then running you know it's it's gonna feel so good you're gonna run so much faster you know but I'm not trying to do it in any unhealthy way like forcing myself to like not eat food or restricting calories or anything like that like I all I simply did was instead of lifting heavy weight slowly, I just started lifting lightweight quickly. Hmm. And all the running that I do, my body easily shed the weight and kept the strength as well, which is really nice. And so I was able to get back down to like 208, 207, like very, very easily. And I didn't even change how much food I was eating. Nice. Yeah. And um, I remember talking about like different, um, you know, because obviously, you know, your, your strength to weight ratio, that's, that tells you how fast you are. You know, mm-hmm. if you are this strong and you, you know, you have two people that are the exact same strength and one weighs more than the other person, that person will be slower. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, if you taking into consideration technique and things like that and, and sprinting, yeah. um, but you know, if they're, if you're both track athletes then obviously you're probably going to have decent, decent techniques. So after that, then you're going to, it's just going to come down to strength to weight ratios. Um, I think we were talking about like the, the hex bar deadlift, like the trap bar deadlift yeah. as well. Did you, did you sort of look into that? Because there was a guy, there was a trainer for, um, you know, as I was telling you, for people that don't know, there's a, there's a trainer, uh, that he trains all the, does all like the combines. So he basically takes like the top eight sort of prospects for the NFL combines and he only, only trains with those top guys. And it's like something like, you know, 20 grand or more or something like that for like an eight week course that he does with them. He just, just trains with them and, uh, and he gets them like, like these guys get, get taken up. And like, there was one guy, he was a quarterback and he dropped his 40 time by 0.5 seconds, dropped it down from like a five Oh to a, to a four five as a quarterback, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and so he was doing that and like his mainstay was the hex bar deadlift. 
um, but just doing just just lifting up and then dropping. And uh, what that was doing is that increased the strength, but it didn't tear down the muscles and, and, and cause it to rebuild and hypertrophy. So yeah. you stayed the same, you stayed the same weight, but you got stronger. So your 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 force to weight ratio improved. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that I've really been focusing on too recently is mm. um, as a decathlete, you're just training all the time. There's not as much rest as you would like it to be. And trying to make sure that I'm not destroying myself in the gym to where I can't perform well on the track is really important for me. And so, like you said, just trying to do more of those um, concentric lifting where it's just really activating your nerves and getting your muscle fibers to contract, but you're not damaging them. And so you're able to recover much quicker. And it's just all about the neural recruitment is super beneficial. And it's helped me also to where my muscles are getting stronger and I'm not getting heavier. And so I can run faster. Nice. So do you have noticed an improvement with that? Yeah, for sure. And we do, nice. we do something like similar to this, um, the hex bar, but we'll do it with a squat where it'll be like on the rack and you just get under it and then you just pop up and then let it drop back down. Hmm. And that's, it's, it's super huge for just, you feel so bouncy afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, um, they were saying that like just doing that actually as, as a, as a warm up, people performed objectively better in plyometric uh, sort of exercises. Yeah. And then in, in the 40, you know, they did that and they sort of tuned it up and their action fibers were sort of more locked in. So more of the muscles fibering, uh, fibers were firing at one time uh, or mm -hmm. higher percentage of the muscle fibers. If people don't, it's, it's, it's technical, but if you look at, if you look at a, a you know, sarcomere, like, which is, um, you know, just like a, a muscle fiber under a microscope, um, it, it has these little teeth that sort of lock up all the way down. And so if you have just a few of those teeth, locked up here, you contract, it contracts like right there. But if you have most of those things sort of bound up, then it's going to have a harder contraction. And so by doing a few of those, um, you're going to bind those up and they're going to be just more ready to go. And they're going to give a, a harder fire. Whereas if we, when you do the, the eccentric where you sort of go down where the, the muscle is locked, but now you're, you're lengthening the muscle against resistance while you're, you're trying to resist it those action fibers are still stuck there and they don't actually release and come down and, and, and catch down. They stay there and you're basically just ripping them apart. And so that's yeah. why there's actual breakdown at a, uh, at a molecular level a microscopic level. Um, mm -hmm. and then that has to rebuild and repair and things like that. Um, yeah. so you're not doing that. You just, you just sort of bang, hit that big contraction and then you drop it and then it stays up there. It stays like totally locked up and bound up. And, uh, and this is also why a lot of people don't stretch. A lot of like, you know, top like athletes. And I think like the, the Netherlands, uh, national soccer team, like they just don't stretch, you know, after, especially after they work out, they don't stretch and they're, they're one of the top teams, uh, you know, in, in the world. Um, but yeah, so that just having that, those, those linkages more bound up and tight before you go and do a competition, uh, has apparently met with uh, objective improvements in outcome. Have you have you done that as a, as a warm up and then gone out and, and um, run? Usually, like we'll do it a few days before, and you like the theory is that like if you do like a really big output like a few days before, mm -hmm. then kind of like that neural activation will stay with you for at least like a few days, and so hopefully it leads into that competition. But I've heard of like. I think the guy who has the high jump world record did like a huge squat the day of his like high jump competition. And and he has the world record. It still stands today. And he's like got in the eighties or something. Nice. And so, yeah, like it, it definitely works. Yeah. Well, maybe try that, you know, just in, in your training, you know, if you're going to go out and do some, some runs or something like that, just do, you know, like, I think, I think what they were saying, what this guy was saying, was just like sort of like six to eight rep range or something like that, or five to six or something like that of just the, the concentric, just lifting up and dropping and just do like, you know, a few sets of that. And then, and then you get out there and just, you can take off because you're not breaking down the muscle and, mm -hmm. you know, especially as a carnivore, you're going to recover, you're going to be fine. And so, you know, um, and, and he's noticing this benefits in just, just people that are eating whatever they're eating. And uh, whereas I think that, like, you would be doing even better. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, give, that, give that shot, recovery right? aspect is huge. Yeah. Well, you could even you can even try it, you know, just in your own training, just see how you're running and uh, see what your time is. Bounce out a couple sets of the of the concentric hex bar and mm -hmm. run it again, you know, and see yeah. how you do, you know. Like especially with the sprints, I mean, it's it's hard to fake a sprint. You're just running yeah. flat out, you know, or you're yeah. and that's it. Yeah, and it's it's one of the best measures of like muscle output too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, just going back a bit, like to your your test, you were saying as well, you got like a DEXA scan, like body composition scan. Um, yeah. Did you get that? Did you get like a number, like be able to compare them, or is this the the first one you got? Yeah, so um, I only got one, and it was interesting. Is because I'm in um, my major is kinesiology here at Michigan State, and so I was taking an exercise physiology class, and they were like, "All right, we're gonna use a DEXA machine. Who wants to get scanned?" And I was like, "Oh, of course, obviously, yeah. I want that." Um, and so I got my DEXA read. Sadly, I don't know how accurate it is because I kind of didn't fit on the table. You know, I'm six, six, I'm two meters tall. And I don't know, the table is just not built for guys my size. Either way, it only cut off like a tiny bit of my forehead. Um, and the DEXA had me at a 12% body fat, which is like, I guess some people would be like, oh, that's like kind of high, you know, for what we would expect to see you as like, we think, oh, you're like a lean athlete, whatever. Um, and I'm pretty sure that just the DEXA goes over the whole body and definitely like it incorporates your head into the calculation. And we already know your brain is like 70% fat or whatever. It's just so much cholesterol, which is, you know, whole nother thing about why cholesterol is good for your brain. But um, so, yeah, I got that done. And then in the same day, we were like trying to compare like all the different measurements of body fat. And so I did the bod pod, which is where you sit in an air compressed tank and then they measure your displacement of the air. And the body fat percentage for that said that I was around five to seven percent. Mm -hmm. So it was much lower. And then the last one I did was the electrical impedance where you just hold on to two electrical sticks and it sends a circuit through your body to measure kind of like how much the current is impeded and the faster it goes through you, the less fat you have. And then it calculated my fat to be like, I think it was like, yeah, it was like 4% body fat with that. So all very good measurements, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and it, you know, my, like you, you, before we got on here, you sort of held that up. Um, and you were saying it's like, if it's, if it's yellow, like that's bits of fat. And like, yeah. we were looking at this, it was like, we cannot find any yellow on this thing. Yeah. You want me to grab that? Yeah. Yeah. See this thing. This was the, yeah. Yeah. This is the thing. And this is the scale down here. You can see the yellow yeah. is the fat. And yeah. So this, this is saying that like, you know, if, if there's yellow on it, then that's, then that's fat. And, and they're saying that like 12% of that picture is supposed to be yellow, but I didn't see any yellow. Yeah. And so so like, I, don't, I don't know, maybe it was just, maybe it was just a bit, um, it was a bit wonky that day or like you didn't fit on it quite right. Didn't know what the hell to do with it. So yeah. that's, that's kind of funny. I would, uh, yeah, maybe see if get another test because the, you know, those other, there's other tests, you know, the, those other tests, um, I've seen, uh, you know, different people, uh, that have done that and they've found it matched up quite, quite well with the DEXA scan. And mm -hmm. so it, like quite consistently, it was, it was they were yeah. quite similar. And so that having that big disparity, you have to sort of wonder, uh, you know, or not. What, what's going on. Yeah. Because, you know, the other two were quite similar and it was just the DEXA scan that was actually the, the outlier, whereas normally they all sort of sync up pretty, pretty well. Yeah. 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 So like what a DEXA scan would see, uh, as well, you know, I mean, that's the thing too, because they're, they would all account for visceral fat, you know, yeah. and, uh, and intramuscular fat. So it's, it's, it's quite funny. Yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't see any fat around no. my viscera. So no, no. Yeah. And so, well, either way, you know, still very good, very good numbers and still very healthy. So that, that's good. Yeah. Um, you know, did your, did your doctor, 
bark at you about anything? Did he, did he find something to get mad at you about well, like, your blood? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's pretty good. I had, um, like there was two liver markers or maybe they're kidney markers, but one was ALP, which I'm pretty sure is a enzyme or something that your liver produces to help you break down protein. And mine was high, but also it was high compared to the general population who is malnourished. So <laughs> and not eating know. a lot of protein. Yeah. So I I didn't think it was a bad thing. I was like, oh, that's great. It means I can digest protein better. Yeah. <laughs> um and then the other one was my creatinine levels, which is just the byproduct of creatine. And that was a little bit high, but also again related to protein and I don't think it's a bad thing. I know a lot of athletes will have high creatinine levels just because we're processing and burning and going through so much creatine. So it's just, it's naturally occurring. Yeah. And, and you know, at the end of the day, it's generally the solution for that is just drinking more water. Sometimes that can yeah. be an early sign of dehydration. It's just that your, your, your uh, kidneys are having to, you know, concentrate your urine, you know, more and more and more to, to hold on to the water. And, uh, and then it sort of reaches that capacity where it's like, you know, to hold on to enough water, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to sort of retain, you're not going to to cycle these things through and, and get, get as much of this stuff out as your body may want to. And yeah. so just by increasing the amount of water you eat, that just, that just flushes out. And, and especially for athletes like yourself, that are just you know, working really hard all the time, you're going to have higher breakdown of, of, uh, of these different sort of products. You know, people can get uh rhabdomyolysis, which is like, you know, they run a marathon and, and, um, and they don't stay on top of the, the hydration, things like that. They can actually build up their creatinine so high, they can actually get a kidney damage. And, um, and so, you know, that, but the solution for that is just loading them with water and just putting them on IV drips and just water, 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 water. And you just sort of flush this stuff out and your body heals. So, you know, either way, it's not, it's not a big deal. You know, just drink a little more water maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And it could also easily be affected the morning of the test, you know, Oh, did I wake up and how much water did I have in the morning? You know? So it wasn't, it wasn't enough to scare the doctor. And he was honestly like, Oh yeah, like this is, a lot better than I thought it was going to be like all your markers are really good. And he even offered, he was like, yeah, we can retest in a few like months from now too, and see if anything changes. So I might have to take him up on that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to sort of keep track of these things, you know, but for, for I think it's more for curiosity sake than anything else. Oh, I, mean, sure. I, never, I never really, tested, just <laughs> yeah, I never, I never really just text, tested my, my bloods because I'm like, well, I, I just understand what's going on physiologically. This is the optimal way for me to be eating. And so whatever my bloods are doing, that's what they're supposed to do. That's the best they're going to do. And yeah. so I don't really see the point in doing this, but for, for other people, I'm like, all right, I'll check it. And it, you know, they were all great. And, um, but for me, I'm not like, okay, I need to keep an eye on these things. I don't, you know, I don't think that it, it, you, you do need to do that necessarily unless there's a problem really. Exactly. Unless you're just curious. No, for sure. And I think it's, I think it's funny how like kind of going into the test, I was a little like cautious of like, Oh, like, what am I going to see? Um, Cause there's kind of like this weird false narrative going around the fitness world where it's like people on test or people on carnivore, like had like lowered their testosterone. Yeah. And like, I don't know where that came from. I know that there was like a, somebody was like, Oh, like it happened to Paul Saladino or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, guys not really carnivore but oh well well. (laughs) and um and so like i was kind of going in like wondering what my testosterone was gonna be and i was just like so surprised to see it just increase by 400 and it was just awesome yeah well you know but that but that's that's what i see you know Mm -hmm. i mean i didn't test my testosterone beforehand but when i tested it it was it was in a great range and like i'm not I'm not in my early twenties, you know, and, and my testosterone was still good. Um, and, um, and that's what I see in patients. I see their testosterone going up. I see you yeah. know, women, their hormones, uh, optimizing as well. And in athletes, mm-hmm. especially I see testosterone go way up. So there was, um, uh, it was, there's a few rugby players that I know that have gone mostly 
mostly carnivore. Maybe they're still having like a bit of carbs because they just still can't just quite get over, you know, like not eating carbs, but you know, a lot of them have and are just eating meat. And those are the ones that you know, I've never felt stronger. I've never felt better. I've never, you know, been able to, to, to feel like that and feel that good. And you, and you, know, you test their, their testosterone and the same thing. They, they jump up. One guy jumped from uh, like 500 and something up to like 1100. So it like, like doubled. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and so, and that's the thing. And then you, you have to sort of ask, and I'm sure a lot of people are asking all oh, they're probably on steroids. These are athletes. That's what athletes do. They take a bunch of steroids, but like in your case, you got tested yeah. and, uh, and there's, there's no dodging that, you know, NCAA is, uh, is quite strict with that. You know, the Olympic committee is extraordinarily strict with that. And they have yeah. taken over USA rugby, um, years ago. So when I was, when I was still playing before I went to medical school, they had taken over, uh, and so, you know, the rugby players were under the same restrictions as Olympic athletes. And so you go to these tournaments that, that none of the other other teams are restricted to. But like the, the U.S. teams weren't allowed to drink like Monster and Red Bull. Right. Because that was against the the Olympic yeah. guidelines as performance enhancing substances. And then all the other teams are just crushing like three cans of Monster and Rockstar before they go out on the field. And they're like, OK, this is a clear disadvantage. And yeah. um you know, and the, and the testing is, is no joke. You know, we were talking about, you had some, uh, some people you were talking about that, you know, that, that sort of missed their testing dates and they're like, I thought, thought that was unfair, but it was probably because they were dodging these sorts of, uh, these yeah. things because they probably wouldn't have gotten a good result. Um, it's very hard to dodge these things. It's very hard. Like in the NFL, um, at least historically, there were workarounds on how you could sort of you know, work around that certainly in rugby. Uh, when I was in the UK, there were just days that the coach just said, Hey, you know, those who, you know, you know, are going to do well on like a random drug test probably don't show up on Tuesday. And so like <laughs> you show up and there's just like seven of us there, everyone else is just, you know, just sick that day, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was when the, the random testing would come in. So, you know, this is, there, there are, you know, that is a thing in, in athletics, yeah. but you know, in, in, in your case and in, uh, you know, with the Olympic uh, committee sort of things, like they come to your house and mm -hmm. they will come in and they will say like, you're taking the test is taking it right now. Can't take it any other time or else, you know, that's it. You're, you have a, if say, like sometimes you, like if you, if you say no, if you like refuse, like you can't compete for like a year or something like that. Yeah. You know? And, um, and they, they take you into the bathroom and they watch the urine leave your body and go into the cup. And it's like, they have to have eyes on it the whole time. And like, mm -hmm. it's, it's super, super, super invasive and, um, yeah. and intrusive, I should say. And, <laughs> um, and that's like, and that's it. So there's, it's not really, there's not, not much getting around that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's what people are going up against and they're, and they're, not that and they're testing negative and they're coming through just like you but their yeah. their testosterone levels are jacking up as if they were taking these exogenous uh hormones yeah. and you're getting more results because it's happening physiologically and healthfully and in proportion in relation to the rest of the hormones and systems in your body and so you know this is this is better than steroids there i said it carnivores oh, better than for steroids sure. <laughs> for sure. I definitely agree. And um I think it's funny too cuz I've heard the the rumor of like if you eat too much meat that has like hormones added hormones for the cow, they add hormones for the cow. If you eat too much of that meat, you're going to test positive on a drug test. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. I eat way more meat than any of these athletes who have claimed to test positive because of meat and I <laughs> did not test positive at all, you know. <laughs> It's not, it's not going to happen and it's nothing anybody needs to worry about. Yeah. You know, I, I would definitely suggest like all athletes who are like up and coming or young athletes, you know, if you're trying to do everything you can to be successful and you want to raise your testosterone, like don't turn towards the dark side of sports and start looking into steroids, you know, do mm. natural way first and like going carnivore can increase your testosterone on a steroid level you know yeah and and it increases so many other things 
your your physiological benefits are oh yeah 100 yeah so much more and even just the not eating carbs i mean you know you were saying yourself you just have boundless energy you can just keep going and keep going and keep going because you're not eating carbs you don't have to keep refueling and refeeding and keep sort yeah. of feeding the beast and throwing in you know more fuel on the fire you just go you know, you have yeah. a nuclear reactor as opposed to, you know, just firewood that you have to sort of keep, keep chucking on kindling, you know? Uh-huh. hundred percent. Yeah. So that's a massive advantage for any, any athlete, you know, a high endurance uh, or, or sprinters or, uh, yeah. you know, more, more, uh, you know, well, like the sprinters or lifters or uh, that sort of intense, intense sort of things like, or, or the, the track or the distance runners, like it's going to help everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm just baffled that not more distance runners are doing like a keto or carnivore mm. diet because like it like it's just known everyone always are, is out here telling you like oh yeah distance runners they burn fat that's why they're so skinny and you know well like hey, if I burn fat why not just eat fat you know why would I eat carbs like that's just so much work for my body to turn that into fat mm. <laughs> you know yeah. and I I just know like if you're eating all fat and your body's burning fat, it's just going to be so much easier on your body. And you're not going to have all that excess carbohydrate crap that your body has to try and process and deal with. And you're just going to have so much more energy. Yeah. Well, you know, at some point you're not going to be able to run a marathon on, uh, on your glycogen. It doesn't matter how much you carbo load. And so yeah. eventually you're going to run out of those carbs. You're going to run out of that glycogen in your muscles and your liver. And so eventually you're going to hit the wall and you're going to get to a point where you can't replenish that. And you're going to feel like crap and you're going to feel like garbage and you're either going to quit there or you're going to push and struggle and fight and vomit. And then you're going to break through the wall. You're going to start making, uh, you know, blood sugar and ketones again. And yeah. so then you're going to start running on your fat. You're going to feel great. You're going to the runner's high and second win. Why wouldn't you just start with that? Why wouldn't you just yeah. skip the carbs in the first place, start out past the wall and, mm -hmm. and, and be keto and fat adapted so that you're producing a lot of ketones and, and you're very well able to utilize them and make a sufficient amount of, of carbs for your, yeah. for your endurance meat. I, I think that just conceptually makes so much more sense. Yeah. And I, it just baffles me that like people are still trying to do carbo loading when like mm -hmm. the guy who invented it literally came back and he was like, guys, it doesn't work. I was yeah. wrong. And I think he's like keto now anyways. Yeah. 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 Um, Professor Tim Noakes. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, Tim Noakes. Yeah. And he's like going against everything he was saying about carbo loading all this. And it just makes so much sense to me. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head too, like if you, if you try to carbo load and then like, I know a lot of these like athletes are warming up for like an hour, an hour and a half before their event. How are you not just like burning through all your carbs during that hour? And then you come to the line with pretty much the same amount as like you would have, if you just ate normally, mm. you know, yeah. <laughs> like I just, I just, it doesn't work. And it's been proven that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And, and in clinical trials, randomized controlled trials with athletes, you know, keto adapted or eating carbohydrates, like they don't, you're not losing anything. You're still able to, to push yourself, uh, and just make all your own, your own, uh, carbs and energy. And then they switch the groups. And so the people that were eating carbs, then went keto and vice versa. And sure enough, they found they like, yeah, shit, no, like even then <laughs> once they get keto adapted, you know, they're able to put, push, um, push themselves to the same extent as when they were eating carbohydrates, you don't need the carbohydrates. And the added benefit being that you never run out of carbohydrates, that yeah. you're always going to continually replenish your blood sugar and glycogen. And that, mm -hmm. and that is a major, major, major uh, point that, that people are seriously missing in this, you know, on the other side of this conversation. Yeah. 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 And that's like yeah. one of the biggest things is during the decathlon, as I see so many athletes are like, you have, you have five events each day. Mm -hmm. And so athletes will be replenishing their glycogen because they're, they're not keto adapted. Right. And so they'll just, will like run the 100 meter. And then during long jump, they're already like eating a, like a cliff bar or like scooping down peanut butter and like all this stuff. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, are you, does that not just like feel like crap? You know, like, I feel like if you're boosting your insulin, it's just going to be way more inflammatory and it's going to be a lot harder to be an athlete. If you're inflamed, you're going to be way more injury prone. And then also if you're 
eating food, it's boosting your insulin, you're getting parasympathetic, you're going to be more relaxed, you're going to be more lethargic. It's just so much harder to try and get yourself hyped up to compete again. You know, and that's this is like only the second event and you got a five, six hour day ahead of you, you know, and then you got to go to sleep and recover as much as you can to come back the next day. And I'm just finding so much benefit with like, I'm not going to eat anything, you know, I don't need to eat anything during the competition and my body's going to create all of the energy it needs and also all of the benefits of not eating through like being a little bit fasted or even getting the benefits of like having ketones in my blood is very anti-inflammatory and I'm going to actually recover better that night and come back fresher the next day. Yeah. And, um, you know, also like, I mean, even, even like all the different sorts of, um, ways that this can sort of slow you down, you're just eating, you're going to divert blood to your digestive tract. Yeah. That blood is now not available to your muscles, yeah. Straightforward, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you want all of that blood available to your, your brain and your, and your muscles so that you can just go. And, um, you know, that's why I, I always noticed that I never felt, I always felt much better when I didn't eat on the day of a performance. So I was, yeah. I would, I'd never eat before. And every time I had like breakfast or something like that, or even if it was like a, like a night game, it was like seven o'clock at night. And I would always think, Oh, maybe I should eat down earlier and this, that, and the other. every time I ate, I regretted it. Every single time I ate, I regretted it. And yeah, uh, yeah it's just, it's just, it was never the same. I never had the same energy. It never, never felt as, uh, as explosive as I, as I did otherwise, uh, which sort of you know, brings you to the point you're, you're getting ready for nationals now for, for the, for the D1 nationals. Um, what, what is your game plan or maybe, you know, what did you do at the big 10 and, and during competitions? Do you eat during the day? What is your, what is your routine as far as, as what you're eating on comp during competitions? Yeah. So, um, like usually before competitions, depending on how, when the competition is like, I like to, if I can have like four hours before the competition, I'll eat something, but usually it's a lot more fatty and I like getting a lot of fat in there. Obviously there's going to be protein with the fat. Um, but I won't like stuff myself full, mm. you know, and like r eggs are super easy. And especially like when we're traveling, getting in a hotel, I'll just buy a carton of eggs and just crack like some raw eggs and drink, drink it down, you know, nice. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's super easy. And then like for the rest of the day, I'm just going to listen to my body. And if my body's like, dude, we're starving, we need to eat. Then I have pemmican. Um, and I can eat that and be satiated a little bit with it, but usually I don't ever really feel like I need to eat. And like this past competition, like both days, I was just kind of like, I was like talking to my dad and I was like, you think I should eat? And I was like, I don't really, I'm not hungry. Like, and he's like, yeah, you have enough energy to like continue competing for the next like three days. So like, you're fine. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's true. That's true. So like, I'm, I'm good. And it's, it's nice too. Cause I got my dad on the carnivore diet. Nice. And so now like when I'm at track meets and stuff, he'll like bring me a steak after I'm done yeah. competing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. but either, yeah. Like either way, like I don't, I don't eat anything during competition really. Mm -hmm. And I, I just feel great and I don't feel hungry and I don't feel like I need to eat. And then right after competing, I'll just eat a massive meal and you get all that food in your system and then go to sleep, wake up the next day and keep going, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's a, and that's what I, I always did too. Um, yeah. Just big steaks and things like that. And then, and you sleep and you're just nothing, you know, so yeah. like even tournaments like sevens tournaments where you'd be playing like the whole day, um, some of these things, and sometimes they're two day tournaments, sometimes one day tournaments, but like, you know, sometimes if you're, you're playing, like you might, you might play six games in a day for sevens, it's shorter. It's like 14 minute games, but like, it's a track meet, like it's just a dead sprint the whole yeah. time. And so it's a, a lot of running. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, conditioning and things like that. And so you play six games in a day. You know, most people are just, just done in. Whereas yeah. like, you know, I would just feel, still feel great, you know, <laughs> and, uh, oh. at the end of that. And, 
you know, and it's uh it's a it's a huge advantage to be able to 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 maintain your level of athleticism uh towards the end of the day when everyone else is is crapping out. And that's yeah. and that's the thing, especially you know, and and the decathlon is is gonna be the same thing. It's 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 you have to like you can do really well in the first couple events, but it's not about it's the first couple of events, it's about all 10. You know, yeah. and so, you know, you have to be doing well on the the last, you know, two events of the day, you know, when you're tired and run down and it's been hours and you're just like out there in the sun and the hot, and you're just like, Jesus, yeah. you know, that's and, when you perform. Yeah. Like the pole vault is the seventh event and that, that event is notorious for having people like no height. And mm-hmm. so like, if you, if you know height, if you don't clear any pole vault bars, you're going to get zero points for that event. You're pretty much out of the competition you know and if you like if you feel like crap by then like you gotta pull something out you know and um also it's like another thing is you have to make it to the end of the decathlon a lot of the times it's just a war of attrition and you can expect at least two or three guys each decathlon to either stop competing because of injuries or like they know height or something and they just get burnt out and they have to stop yeah and so like the carnivore diet has definitely helped me just be able to keep going. Yeah. Awesome. So how, how do you feel at the end of, of the decathlon this year? Like, um, once you get to the end of the competition, how's your body feeling? Yeah. I mean, like, obviously if you put everything out there on the field, you're going to feel like pretty destroyed. Mm-hmm. But, um, like in, in the reality of things, it's like, okay, well, like if I needed to keep going, I probably could, yeah. <laughs> I could probably keep going. And then honestly, like if I, if I sleep that night and I wake up in the morning, I usually feel like pretty decent. And, um, it's funny. Cause like after this past decathlon, I was like, I want to experiment with like giving myself a little bit longer recovery than normal. You know, usually it'll be like two, like, it'll be like three or four days of recovery. And this time I was like, I'm just going to take it easy for like five to seven days. And like, uh yesterday I lifted in the gym for like it was like one of the first days back and I felt like way too good. Like I was like, man, I could just do so much damage right now. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like it's like crazy how how much the body will recover. And I I feel like I can recover really good in like two to three days. If I give myself like a full taper of like four to seven days, I'm just like all cylinders are firing, like everything is great. And another great thing too is a lot of people are worried about they feel like they always need to train and they feel like they always need to like be hitting it hard in the gym every single day i guarantee you like i could sit on the couch for like three four weeks of no training but as long as i'm eating a carnivore diet my body's going to stay in shape Mm -hmm. and i'm not going to lose the muscle mass i'm not going to lose like my like all the training that i have and i could probably go like pop off a really great decathlon after like sitting for a few days. And like, I think that's the thing is like, it's just your body's going to stay in such better shape if you're not in constant inflammation. And also if you're giving it so much protein, it's just going to, it's going to keep the muscle. It's not going to shed it off so quickly. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I always notice that the recovery is so much easier. It's so much better. You can do so much more, but yeah, you're right. If you do give your body like a while to recover, like you you just feel so much better because you can definitely overtrain. You can definitely wear yourself down. And uh, and that's not what you want to do. It's harder on a carnivore diet, but even then, you know, giving yourself an adequate chance to to recover, like you're just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're then you're you're just fully built up yeah. and just ready to crush it. But I I have to like force myself because like after decathlon two days after decathlon I'm like all right let's get back to it let's start training yeah. you know but like I have to I have to look long term and say all right I got nationals in two weeks maybe mm-hmm. we just take a few more days off and then I can mm-hmm. feel really good to train this next week and then get ready for nationals you know yeah and so it's like. I just like, I, I can push myself way too quickly because I just feel so good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just trying to like milk it and get it to be like optimal. Like I feel amazing. You know, that's how I always want to feel. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully you get, get a, a good enough time to go into nationals like that and just go into nationals, just feeling, feeling like a yeah. superhero. For sure. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, so sort of tag on to that, like, you know, after the after the you know the cafe, obviously you put everything out there, but like on the last event, how do you feel on the last event? Like you you know, like that you have to like put everything out there as the last one. How do you how are you feeling now as opposed to previously before you're doing carnivore? Yeah, and oh man, the last the last event is always crazy because you have to run a fifteen hundred. Oh, as yeah, the last nice. event, which is like just short of a mile. Yeah. And um, like to be fair, I never I never ran the decathlon until after like I, I was carnivore for my first decathlon. Mm -hmm. But I had done heptathlons before, which are like the same same concept, seven events, you know, but it's indoors and you're still running far, you're running a thousand meters. And if anything, people will argue that the 1000 is harder than the 15 because you're running at a faster pace. Mm. Um, and so running that 1000, like the last event after two days of competition while like not doing carnivore. Oh my gosh. Like I just would hit a wall, you know, mm. <laughs> if I wasn't careful, I would really have to pace myself because I'm like, if I'm running too hard right now, I'm just going to hit a wall and I cannot just, I can't run through that wall. I'm just going to be dead. Mm. And like before that, before that 1000, you're like, all right, I got to eat like this sugary stuff so I can like increase my blood sugar, give myself energy for the race and all this stuff. And, you know, you're running and you're kind of like your arms are starting to cramp up and like, it's just, it's not a good feeling, you know? <laughs> Um, but like now that I'm on carnivore and even like this past year running the 1000 indoors, like just feels so much easier, feels so much better. And it's just a huge confidence booster walking up to the line and knowing that like, I don't feel like crap. These guys probably feel like crap. And like, I know that I'm putting all the good stuff in my body to help me succeed right now. Yeah. That's yeah, funny. so it's 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 definitely a game changer. Just feeling good for that last event. Yeah. So, um, how did how did you do on this last 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 round on the on the fifteen hundred? This oh yeah, this last fifteen hundred, I had a a personal best. Oh, nice. There you go. Yeah, I ran. I think it was a four minute forty three second. Nice. So. It's pretty good. I mean, nothing compared to the guys who are training the 1500 every single day. Yeah. You know, um, we'll train that about like once a week, but <laughs> still pretty tough. And I, that would probably uh, be pretty close to, I don't know, I, I, that would be probably a sub five minute mile if I continued for that next hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's awesome, man. Uh, yeah. that's, that, that was, it's great that you can actually set PRs, you know, yeah. as at the last event you know, as well, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to like in training where you're like, you're set and ready and rested to go. And just, you know, you're going yeah. and pushing it out there. That's awesome that you can do that at, at the end of a competition. Yeah. And it's, it's great too. Cause the event before that, the ninth event or yeah, the ninth event, the javelin, I ended up throwing a PR as well. So <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. That's really good, man. Well, that's good. Well, hopefully that, that just continues and rolls into, into, nationals and get enough uh rest for that um yeah. you know talking about that as well you know like just like the the clear advantage this has on athletes and like why more people aren't doing it i guess it, it's good for you you know because it's just like all right well don't you don't take the the super juice like i don't i'm not stopping yeah. you from <laughs> doing that and um you know but some people you know like in uh, especially in like um australia aussie rules uh or or Australian rugby in uh, rugby league, there's a number of guys that are revitalizing their careers by going on a carnivore diet. And they're, they're these guys who are these top, top performers, top athletes, but they're just sort of in their thirties now. And they're, they're, their bodies are slowing down and breaking down and they've just got, you know, years of, of wear and tear. And they're just like, uh, they're just not, they're not uh, able to do as much as they were when they're in their, in their twenties. And then they go on carnivore and all of a sudden, bam, they're outperforming, yeah. you know, all their competition, their younger competition and feeling amazing. And I, I certainly felt the same way, you know, in my late thirties, now in my forties, 
I, I feel amazing. I don't, I don't have, I have no lag down. I mean, I, I just have a, you know, broken wheel. So I have my, my knee swells up anytime I try to sprint. So I had to get surgery. Um, mm -hmm. so hopefully trying to rehab that, but like my body feels amazing, like muscular, yeah. Um, uh, you know, my musculature and, and it's just like my sprint. I, I was playing a season here and I was dead sprint, like running back. I was just, I felt great. You know, I was one of the fitter guys on the team and, and, you know, you know, still had, had a lot of speed and I was like, yep, yeah, this is great. I'm just going to go crush people. And this stupid knee started swelling up. So, you know, but there are a lot of people that are revitalizing, you know, their yeah. careers and, um, you know, as it was, we were saying this before this, like, you're going to start seeing, you know, the, the ages of professional athletes who do this, getting older and older and older and extending their careers. So this can not yeah. only give you a career in the first instance by helping your body work optimally. So you have a clear advantage, or at least your body's working as well as it possibly can. So you putting in the hard work is then going to uh, do a lot more for you. And then you're going to have much more longevity, you know, uh, you know, barring any sorts of, you know, weird injuries, you know, you're, mm -hmm. going, you're less likely to get injured also. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you're, you know, if your body works to this extent, like you're just going to keep going and going and going and you're in your, your thirties and you're in your forties and you've got 30 years of experience, you know, 20 years of professional experience. You get into your forties and fifties, you have 30 years of professional experience. No one's messing with you. You know, yeah. especially like these, these skilled things, you know, Tom Brady actually did carnivore. The dude would probably still be playing. He wouldn't have had to retire, but he went 23 seasons, you know, yeah. and he was getting better and better and better because he's just more and more experienced you know, as he mm -hmm. went, but you know, he just gets sort of sick of it after a while, he's just been doing that his whole life, but you know, he's, yeah. um, you know, he easily be able to keep going another 20 years. If he was on court, mm -hmm. I'd say. It would always like bother me, like as a younger athlete, like coming up and like, I would see like older athletes and like, they weren't really that old. They were like 24, 25 talking yeah. about how, Oh, I'm so old. Like it takes That's me a little bit longer to warm up. Like, body's breaking down i'm like dude you're only like 25 like i, I don't want to be like that when i'm 25 you know yeah <laughs> and like training two years in college not being carnivore i like started to see kind of like oh well like yeah wow my body's kind of like not feeling good and this is a lot of training i can't handle you know switching on to carnivore now and like training two more years on carnivore. And now I'm like, man, I feel like I can go forever. Like I can be, I can continue training each year and each year and each year and more and more and more, you know? And mm -hmm. like, it, like, it makes me see like all these athletes who are going through their careers and just eating a high carb diet and pumping their body full of all this inflammatory stuff. And then they can get away with it because they're like that top 1% athlete who has like, they have good metabolism. They're working out all the time. Like they get away with it. But then as soon as they stop exercising, everything starts to hit them. And like these athletes just become unhealthy because of these bad habits they picked up being an athlete that they thought were healthy and good for them, you know? And like, but that, but that being said, it's never too late to turn it around. Like you said, there's the rugby guys in their thirties, like coming carnivore and then, completely becoming different athletes and like even for me like my dad he's athletic and he loves working out but he's starting to struggle with all these weird issues and he's like kind of stopped working out as much you know and then I was like dad get on the carnivore diet do this do this now he's eating meat and he's just killing the game he's deadlifting like heavy heavy weight and it's just it's so awesome to see him doing that but yeah. like it's just, it's just like athletes need to start to realize that uh, your career doesn't need to end when you're in your thirties, you know, you can go in your forties, you can maybe even go into your fifties and sixties, depending on the sport or whatever, you know, it's just, there's such an opportunity for longevity in the sport when you're doing the healthy things nutritionally and eating carnivore. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, we're designed for it, you know, as we were talking about, you know, before this, you know, Alexander the Great's army, a lot of these guys were in their 60s. You know, they ranged from, you know, in their 20s to in their 60s. And they were on the front line holding a 13-foot steel spear 
you know, just lancing people, fighting these massive armies, and uh, and they had a fifty to one kill ratio, right? Yeah. So it's just nuts. And these guys are just demolishing people. And uh, one of his generals that like led one of his wings of his cavalry, you know, not just out in the in the tents, you know, drawing up plans or anything like that, but out there at the front of the cavalry charge. This guy was in his late seventies. I think he was like 76 or 78. He was in his late seventies. Anyway, he was at the front of the line, you know, with a lance and a sword, just hacking at people, you know, in his late seventies, like you can't do that, you know, unless you're in extraordinarily good shape. But that guy had, you know, 65 years of military experience, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he was probably a stone cold badass. And, you know, you don't, you don't last six decades of warfare uh, without getting killed if you're not a badass and you know yeah. lucky, there's just arrows flying all over the place and things like that you know and you just just chaos but like just to survive that long i mean you know you're you're doing something seriously good and yeah. you know now people are just decrepit by the time that they're in their terrible. 70s and it's, it's yeah it is terrible and you, you don't I mean, want to see it many- how many 76 year olds do you know who could ride a horse at full gallop into a charging battlefield? Like it's, yeah, it's just not full armor with it wielding a sword, you know, half, yeah. you know like it's not going to happen, you know? And, uh, you know, most, most people in their seventies, well, not most, but you know, a lot of people in our seventies, it's not abnormal to have people in their seventies doing like water aerobics and like in a, in a, in a pool and just sort of moving their arms around because that's the most they can do. You know, or yeah. they walk, they're mall, mall walkers and they walk around the mall because it's, you know, sort of warm and, you know, safe environment. And they just, they walk and that's what they can do. They can walk yeah. and, and <laughs> some can't even do that, you know? And it's just like, it's, it's very sad to see because, you know, your body's breaking down prematurely and you're, and you're losing out on decades of vital life, vitality, mm-hmm. right? You know, if we're designed to live 120 years, which is what, it appears we are genetically, you know, we should be that, you know, 70 year old, years old is middle age. You know, I was, I was interviewed that lady, uh, you know, Maggie, the rancher up in Canada. She's an amazing lady. She's 82 years old. She's been a carnivore for nearly 70 years and a rancher. And she's only been eating meat. She hated vegetables as a kid. And like, <laughs> she, like her, she's fought against her parents. And she just only eat the meat. And then eventually her parents just gave up and said, like, oh, look, she's healthy. She's doing well. She just wants to eat meat. Just, you know, just let her do it. She's like, this is just more trouble than it's worth. And, you know, then she, you know, she was in veterinary school and she decided she didn't want to be a vet. She wanted to have her own animals and have her own ranch. And so she went out and worked as a ranch hand in the middle of nowhere. And the only, only thing you ate was what you grow or grow uh, or raise. And so she was like, well, I'm not going to like work to grow yeah. vegetables, like screw that. I don't want to eat them anyway. And so she just, you know, just eat meat. And so that was it that she did for, for the rest oh. of her time. She had 10 kids and as a carnivore the whole time. Yeah. And all the kids were raised just on meat as well. And she's 82 years old. She's still a working rancher. And, uh, you know, so she's out, I was talking to her around Christmas is when I, we were setting up an interview it was around that time. And, and she was saying that she was on Christmas day, it was a blizzard, it was negative 40. And, you know, and she was like, you know, chipping out ice from the cow's hook so they don't, you know, don't die out in the, in the exposure. So she's working 14 hour days on Christmas, uh, you know, over Christmas and oh, in, in these hellish <laughs> sort of conditions, 82 years old. Yeah. You know? and, and that's, that's just like, you know, I'm most 20 year olds aren't going to be able to do that. You know, let alone, you know, someone in their, in their eighties, she has blonde hair. That is her natural hair. She doesn't dye her hair. That's just her yeah. hair. You it's know, not great. It's, it's dude. She's 82. That's crazy. You know? And and she looks like she's like in her fifties. She looks like someone in who like eating sort of normal and, you know, going out to brunches, you know, with the girls and having the Prosecco's and things like that and whatever, <laughs> you know, someone, someone like that, like in their fifties, like that, that's what she looks like. She looks better than yeah. that. And it's like, it's, it's absolutely shocking, uh, mm-hmm. you know, how, how youthful and, and vital she is, but that's how humans are supposed to be. And that's yeah. how we're designed to be. And that's how you can be. If you just give your body what it needs to just do its thing. You just give it what it needs and just leave it alone. It'll take care of itself. 
Yeah, and that's the thing. Just just trust the body, you know. It knows what to do. The body doesn't want to self-sacrifice. It doesn't want to have all these diseases. It wants to survive, you know. And so just yeah. let the body survive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and especially, you know, as, as a, as someone working in those conditions or someone who's like a top athlete, you, you need to give your body exactly what it, what it needs, or you're not, you're not going to make it. You're not going to yeah. be a brancher at 82 in a blizzard, you know, unless, <laughs> unless like everything's firing, uh, you know, just right. And you're not going to, you know, uh, you know, get on the podium at big 10 and go to nationals if you're not doing the same thing. So you know, that's just like a testament to what you're doing, man. And so that's great to see. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's just crazy to see some of these athletes out here who are very successful while they're eating high carbohydrate diets. And like, mm. that's great. But like, I don't know, like what, what could they be achieving without carbs? Like what could they be achieving going carnivore? Like maybe, mm. maybe even better athletes. And um, like you see a lot of like, people in sports are like, maybe like they're, oh yeah, you're a genetic anomaly because you got a longer arm. So you're better at swimming or your Achilles is this shape. So you're better at running, you know? And yeah, like maybe those genetic anomalies are a thing, but there's also people who are genetic anomalies because of their metabolism. And they just happen to luck out and be able to handle carbohydrates better than other people. And like in this world where we push the agenda that you need carbs to be a successful athlete, of course, the people who are going to work better being on a keto diet are not going to be good athletes and they're going to get washed out of the sport. And so we're not really going to see as many people able to be successful, you know, on those high carb diets. So I think it's important for people to know, like, if you're not a successful athlete, just because and you're like, you don't understand why, like maybe go to carnivore, try that out and see if you can fix your metabolism, if you can fix your energy and you might all of a sudden start kicking ass. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and even, you know, even, uh, you know, even, even if you're, you're not in, in one of those genetic anomalies, it's still going to improve you. You're still going to have yeah. an advantage. It's just going to improve your your hormones. It's going to get rid of this stuff, strip this stuff out of your body that is just harmful to you. It's causing direct harm to your body, causing increasing inflammation and damage, and oxidative stress, and and slowing you down and curtailing your performance. And it's going to bolster your hormones and make you healthier. And it's going to give you a better nutritional energy source so that you're able to run constantly on a better fuel source. So, you know, even if you are, a, a, you know, just worth that, you know, not as, as good of an athlete for a number of different reasons, this is going to give you a massive health benefit. It's going to give you a massive performance benefit. And then you're going to be able to push yourself harder. You're going to instantly be better. Or when you get keto adapted, you will be better. But the important thing, you'll be able to push yourself more. And you'll be able to push yourself harder for longer and recover better and get more out of what you did. And so if you keep pushing it and keep pushing it, you will continue to become a better athlete and, uh, and more uh, physically uh, uh, dominant. Um, yeah. And so you just, just remember that and switch your diet, start eating optimally, and then just push yourself. Because you will be able to push yourself a lot harder than you've ever been able to push yourself before. And I'm sure you've noticed this, um, mm -hmm. that like your just ability of like, okay, well, let's, let's really just floor this and just see, see what I can do and just go at a top pace. I'm not going to pace myself. I'm just going to absolutely just, just, you know, pedals to the metal the whole way. And you find like, holy shit, I'm not, I'm not able to wear myself out nearly as, as easily as I did before. I certainly yeah. noticed that. And especially once I got into, you know, season, you know, good in season shape, like I, I just, I just really couldn't, I really couldn't find my limit. I was just, I just, I, the harder I pushed, the more my body gave me. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be able to train so much longer too. Whereas mm -hmm. like for me, at least like I'm a, I'm a great decathlete, but there, there are guys my age who are amazing, like world level they've been they've been doing it for 10 years already i've only been doing it for like four you know and so if i want to last until 10 years from now mm. like i got to do everything i can you know and so maybe maybe i'm not a world level decathlete right now but 
see me again in five years from now when I'm still healthy and I'm not broken down because I'm like too old to keep training <laughs> at 24. You know? Yeah. And, and yeah, then we'll see where I'm at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. And you, and you have those years of experience and, uh, and athleticism behind you. Yeah. I don't, I don't doubt. You're gonna, well, you know, the thing is too, you're, you're, you're still putting up big numbers and like, you know, yeah. if you're, if you're you know getting on the podium in NCAA, you know, D one competitions, you know, I mean, that's where the best track athletes are right now. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so, you know, like you, you know, you have to be world-class to get on there. So I, I wouldn't sell yourself sure. short, but, you know, For but sure. also, but to your point, you know, you, you know, as, as long as your will and determination are still there, your body's going to be able to do it. And you're going to mm -hmm. just keep getting better. You keep going to get fitter. You can keep getting stronger. You're going to keep getting more skilled. And, um, you know, and so you're only going to get better. And I don't think, I think it's just a matter of time, you know, uh, before, you know, you, you see yourself, you know, like, you know, going to the Olympics, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Is that, is that the end goal? Is that what you're going to, uh, looking to do? I don't know. I just want to keep training. I'm having fun with it. You know, <laughs> it's just, you gotta fall in love with the sport and wherever it takes you, it takes you, you know? And, um, but yeah, so I am qualified for collegiate nationals. I'm also qualified for USA nationals. Nice. Um, which is after, which so that'll be a big meet. And there's possibly a few other meets that I'll be qualified for. Um, but we'll see what happens with that. But either way, that's another thing is like this season is turning into a really long season. You know, most people only do two or three decathlons a year. Like right. I have opportunity to do like four or five decathlons a year this year, you know. And so like you got to make sure your body can last through that too. You know, it's very important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just another thing that I feel like is really helpful being carnivore is like if my season gets extended and I want that opportunity to compete at a higher level, like I can take that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's awesome, man. And um, so when when is nationals? Um, so collegiate nationals is uh, like June 7th or something like that. Okay. And then um, the USA Nationals is around early July. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'll, I will do my best to get this out before then, so people can can watch okay. that and then uh, and then try to uh, support you on your on your um, your journey to, at nationals and then competing there. So um, awesome. Ryan, great to see you again, man. It's been too long. Um, yeah, it's great. You're having me. Yeah, no, you're very welcome, man. Thank you very much for coming on. Really glad to see that you're you're still doing so well. It's always great to see that. Um, I was really happy to talk to you last year and see how well you were doing. And then just, you know, seeing you again, just thriving even more, just getting, you know, now you got a full year, year and a half of carnivore under your belt. Mm -hmm. And like, and like I was, I was telling you before, you know, it's just like, you're really going to start seeing like really big improvements in your athleticism this year, I, I predicted. And, and it sounds like that's, that's what you've been seeing. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you. No worries, man. So um, you have uh social media or anything like that where people can follow you and follow your progress, you know, at nationals. Yeah. I'm pretty much just on Instagram, just mm -hmm. underscore Ryan underscore Talbot underscore. And um, yeah, that's about it for now. Maybe I'll start making YouTube videos in the future. And I yeah. feel like that would be fun to kind of document some of this journey. Cause I feel like it's a little bit of a case study at this point, seeing an athlete go carnivore and there's only a very few number of us out there. So it's kind of a fun journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially at your level and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe just one, one question, uh, to finish off. If, if someone were, you know, an athlete did want to come to this, you know, um, and, and said, okay, well, I'm going to, I want to try this for my own, um, you know, my own benefit, my own athletic performance. What would you recommend they do? So some people say they, they're worried because, you know, seasons are long. And so you, you generally catch this in the middle of a season. You say, okay, well, I want to do carnivore, but I'm nervous about doing this in season. What would you recommend to someone who's sort of in, in the middle of a season at, in and in playing, you know, playing like a professional sport or, or, you know, as a, as a top, you know, collegiate athlete, 
would you recommend that they just they just go for it or would you recommend they sort of slot it in an off season or if they have a couple of weeks off yeah um i think the best way is to like just go for it you know cuz it's never going to be a good time for you you know you're always going to have a reason to not do it and so i think you should just go for it but as for like getting into it don't like i wouldn't cut cold turkey right away I would just slowly ease into it, you know, and there's a lot of great um, sources out there of people giving suggestions on this and like slowly cutting your carbs down day by day until you're at like 10 carbs a day, then five carbs and then no carb, you know, Um, obviously increasing the meat, increasing the fat intake and just understand that, yeah, maybe you're going to go through um, a little adaptation period but it shouldn't affect you like crazy. And like, if you are a high caliber athlete, you're usually going to adapt a lot faster than um, somebody who's just not working out. And so I would say just go for it and reap the benefits as early as you can, you know, cause it's just going to keep compounding. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, perfect, man. Well, thank you for that. And uh, hopefully people will, uh, you know, be able to use that, to their advantage and hopefully, you know, they can get, um, they can get their names up, uh, on the, on the scoreboard as well. And then, you know, get into college on a, on an athlete's uh, athletic scholarship and, and, uh, you know, be the next round of, uh, athletes at nationals. So Ryan, yeah. thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll see ya. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys. (music) 